Okay, let's see here. So last time we were talking about directional derivatives. Let me just remind you what directional derivatives are. Right? So remember the big idea, most important thing about directional derivatives is that they are basically partial derivatives. It's just that, you know, partial derivatives are defined in terms of coordinates, and coordinates are arbitrary. Coordinates are made up, manufactured things that aren't really part of the real world that we're trying to describe. Right? So uh, pick your favorite coordinate system. It doesn't matter. Any unit vector can be a standard basis vector if you just pick the right coordinate system. Right? So with that point of view in mind, uh, directional derivatives are really very much just partial derivatives just in directions that are not parallel to an axis. So, uh, uh, so here's the terminology and notation. Here's the definition. Here's the formula we use to compute. And here are the various interpretations that we have, and we talked through all this stuff uh, last time. Uh, I, I do like to point out that this idea of a multiplicative factor motivates this notation, dfds, very natural. If you think about it, this says how much does the function change per unit distance that you travel. Right? A pretty natural thing if you're, uh, you know... Uh, uh, hiking along a mountain road, at, right? And you want to know well, how much does the temperature change as I move along the road? How, for every hundred yards that I walk, how much is the temperature going to change, right? Okay. All right. So with that in mind, uh, we saw this example. And the big idea is that the question asks for the slope of a graph. That is a directional derivative. We compute with the given formula. Yada, yada, yada. Right, it's all details from there. Okay. Um, so uh, picking up from there, next example, really pretty much the same. The question asks something different. The question asks for DTDS. But again, as we just discussed, this is another uh, a, a standard property of a directional derivative. So again, even though the... Kind of the context is a little different, and the phrasing of the questions a little different. It remains. We're still just computing a directional derivative. That's all there is to it, right? So uh, we use this formula: uh, compute, compute, uh, answer. Uh, you know, arithmetic gives uh, gives answer. Okay. Let me uh, let me pause real quick. There is everybody on board. So uh, I do want to remind you of uh, one thing, important detail. Um, <clears throat> this phrasing, the direction of a vector. Keep in mind a vector is a direction and a magnitude. So this means ignore the magnitude, you know, cancel out the magnitude, right? Divide, by, divide out that magnitude, thus resulting in a unit vector. Direction should be interpreted as meaning a unit vector. Uh, so uh, find the unit vector that represents uh, V, and you'll see that that's uh, what I did right there. Right, this unit vector is the vector divided by its magnitude. Okay. All right. Now, here's a, uh, oh, a little math uh, cultural observation, I guess I'd call it. Um, there are those who think that directional derivatives should be defined in a different way. Um, specifically, recall that we define directional derivative with the understanding that the vector has to be a unit vector. And there's various different justifications for this, ranging from uh, mildly to extremely persuasive. Okay. But you don't have to. Right? And uh, again, there are those who prefer to define directional derivative without requiring that it be a unit vector. Now that changes things significantly. Right? Let's come back to, again, where we uh, just were. Um, as we're defining in this course, directional derivative, blah, 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 all these uh, interpretations and convenient formulas, etc. Um, if you remove the requirement that that be a unit vector, then the result is no longer a slope of a graph. It is no longer a multiplicative factor. It is no longer DFDS. All of that goes away, right? And again, the proponents 
uh, of the unit vector version of this uh, would say, well, see, look at all that you lose, right? Um, the proponents of this idea would point out, yeah, but look at all that we gain, right? We get to have a terminology and convenient notation for what is ultimately still a very natural idea. If I'm moving it with some velocity, right, that's pretty real world. I'm at a location. I'm moving with some velocity. It happens all the time, right? And if I want to know how fast the function is changing, yeah, that's pretty natural, right? So this opens up the idea of uh, keeping track of how a function is changing as you're moving with a given velocity. And here's the really good news. Not only does this still describe something interesting, but furthermore, this formula still works too. Right, so there is a pretty good case to be made that directional derivative maybe uh, kind of shouldn't necessarily require that it be a unit vector. Now, um, we, uh, we do have to make a choice in this class, right? We have to uh, all agree on what the words mean and what the notations mean. So I'm going to go with the book's preference on this. The book's preference and the preference of many books uh, is to require that this be uh, a unit vector, right? So all this business that I have in green uh, is uh, no, right? We do require unit vector, uh, and we do, therefore, get all these interpretations here. But uh, two things to be aware of. One is, again, this is not an immediate and obvious choice. There are those out there who would prefer not to do it this way, and I am one of them for whatever that's worth. Right, um, and there are many others. It's not just me. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing you should keep in mind uh, is that you don't necessarily know who you're talking to in any given context outside of this course. Right, outside of this course, if you are talking to somebody and they say directional derivative. Uh, they may just be interested in DFDT computed by that expression, and that's a very reasonable thing to be interested in. And just because they said directional derivative, uh, that may or may not indicate uh, that this is a unit vector. So my uh, earnest uh, advice uh, is that you clarify. Right? <coughs> Outside of this course, Make sure to be aware that there are these two different schools of thought and clarify uh, what the speaker meant when they, uh, when they said the word directional derivative or when they wrote something like this down. Okay. I write. Okay, moving along. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, yeah, here's a neat question with a uh, very satisfying answer. Uh, it's uh, the question of fastest increase or the question of uh, direction of steepest ascent. So here's the, uh, the context. Suppose we have some function. I like, again, my personal favorite metaphor is to think of this as representing temperature just because it's something that we experience in space and that we don't necessarily need to draw a graph of, right? So uh, if uh, I am on a map, <laughs> if I'm in a two-dimensional context, Right? And if I'm interested in how temperature is changing as I move around on the map, then a very reasonable question to ask is, okay, suppose that I'm at a given location, and suppose I want to decide which direction I should walk from that location. So now here's the thing. I could go that way, but I could go this way. Right? I could go that way. I could go that way. I've got a million options for which direction to walk. I am going to restrict our attention to unit vectors because we want to consider only directions. Obviously, if I run faster, the function will change faster. That was that's clear, right? So without you know uh, introducing that uh, uh, confusion, let's just keep it simple, considering directions only, aka unit vectors only. And uh, with that said. All these different directions that I could walk are going to cause the temperature to change at different rates. And I would like to know which direction should we walk 
to make this directional derivative as big as possible. Again, it is an extremely natural question. If I'm out in the woods somewhere and uh, here's where I am, and uh, there's a function describing temperature, and let's say I'm cold, I want to walk. I got. I can walk any direction. I got nowhere to be. Uh, I'll walk whichever direction is going to make me be warmer as fast as possible, right? So I want to walk in the direction that makes temperature increase as fast as possible, greatest directional derivative as possible. Therefore, does that make sense to everybody? Is a natural thing to want to figure out how to do, right? So I've got to choose. Then I've got to figure out how to decide. Um, which of these directions should I pick? Okay, now before we get to the answer, let me talk about lingo a little bit. Uh, do keep in mind, let me just clean up the mess. This is getting a little out of hand here. Um, <clears throat> that uh, this directional derivative that we're trying to maximize can be interpreted different ways. It can be interpreted as how fast is the function changing, df ds. It could be interpreted alternatively as a slope of a graph. Now, I didn't draw a graph here. I could, I didn't want to, but I could, right? And if you did, then thinking of the directional derivative as a slope, very natural. Okay, so when you find this ideal direction, whichever one of these happens to be the ideal direction, it is the direction that, uh, well, again, it depends on your interpretation. Uh, if you're talking about how fast the function's changing, and if this is the direction that makes that as fast as possible, I think it makes sense to call this the direction of fastest increase. Because you've chosen the direction that makes f increase as fast as possible. Natural language. Um, likewise, now, a different interpretation. If you've drawn a graph, and if you're thinking about directional derivative as indicating slope, the direction that makes the slope as 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 high as possible, that's the direction in which the hill that the graph represents is the steepest. And as you move in that direction, as you ascend the mountain, the hill, in that direction, I think it makes sense to call this the direction of steepest ascent. Um, <clears throat> both of these are standard terminologies. Uh, I will point out uh, to my uh, frustration. Uh, this is actually the one that's the more common, and I don't, I don't really care for that myself. Um, this idea of steepest ascent only makes sense if you're looking at a graph. What if we aren't looking at a graph? This doesn't make any sense. What if I can't look at the graph? What if uh, we have three input variables, one output variable? That happens all the time, right? Temperature in this room. Three input variables, one output variable temperature. I can't draw the graph. It's a four-dimensional picture. I can't do it. So I, yeah, I think this terminology is a little narrow and uh, uh, potentially confusing. This makes sense in any context. Whether you're looking at a graph or whether you're not looking at a graph. In any context, the direction that makes the dir directional derivative as high as possible is the direction in which the function is increasing as fast as possible. It's always the direction of fastest increase. So you're going to hear me say direction of fastest increase. You're going to hear other people outside of this course probably lean more toward direction of steepest descent. Okay. All right. So now that we've understood the question and we've understood the lingo, how do we actually find the answer. Okay. All right. So uh, here, oh gosh, uh, here is the um, uh, thing we want to maximize. Want to make that as big as possible. Directional derivatives are computed by dot products. So I want to make that dot product as big as possible. Dot products are computed with this formula. So I want to make that expression as big as possible. Now wait a second, good news, uh, these are unit vectors, that means these magnitudes here are one. That means really, in fact, all I have to do is make, oh, whoopsie, I have to make this expression as big as possible. Oh, wait, the gradient here, this gradient is a 
constant, I claim. The gradient's constant because it depends only on my location, and I haven't started moving yet. I'm still contemplating which of these many directions that I could go do I want to go. And if I haven't moved yet, then A hasn't changed yet, which means as I contemplate all these directions, it's always the same gradient. So therefore, it's always the same magnitude of the gradient. So, all together, grand total. This is what we need to make as big as possible. Cosine theta. It's as simple as that. Let's make cosine theta as big as possible. That's an easy one. Just make theta zero. Because the biggest value of cosine is one, and it's achieved when theta is zero, right? Old high school trick, nothing to it. So this angle between, uh, oh, whoopsie, Ed, it's the wrong color, uh, between the gradient vector where I'm standing and this optimal direction. <laughs> This direction of fastest increase that I'm trying to find, that angle between them, uh, color choices. Uh, ah, I'll use, oh gosh, I'll use the light blue. This angle between them, I just need to make that angle zero. And geometrically, what does it look like when the angle between V and the gradient is zero? If the angle is zero, then again, let me clean up my picture. If that angle is zero, that just means that this is the unit vector in question. Not off of the direction of the gradient, as I, as I uh, was previously uh, open to considering, right? Now, I need the angle between them to be zero, so just the unit vector pointing in the direction of the gradient, that's the ideal direction. That's the direction fastest increase. Everybody on board? Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it always going to be the unit vector pointing in the direction of the gradient? That's yes. Be it's always the direction of fastest increase. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderfully convenient how nicely that works out. All right, next natural question. Now that we've identified what our direction of fastest increase is, that tells us the direction. Well, how fast is the function increasing in that direction? Right? Again, pretty natural question. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, again, back to me in the woods, right? If I'm cold, I would like to know, okay, look, for every 100 yards I walk, how much will the temperature increase? I know which direction to go, but how, <laughs> how far am I going to have to walk to be able to get warm enough, right? So, okay, no problem. How do we compute what the corresponding directional derivative is? Well, again, formula. This is what the directional derivative is. Uh, my optimal velocity direction, I plug in right there, and yada, 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 compute, compute, uh, notice, by the way, that you find yourselves looking at a dot product of a gradient with itself, which, of course, gives you magnitude squared, and the final simplified answer is the magnitude of the gradient. So we have uh, two questions now answered. First question was, what's the direction? of fastest increase. Second question was, what it, what's the directional derivative in that direction? And check it out. Both of the answers basically are the gradient. The direction is the direction of the gradient. The rate of change is the magnitude of the gradient. Both of the geometric features of the gradient relate directly to answers to this very natural question. So this is what I call a geometric characterization of the gradient. Let me remind you, where did the gradient come from? Several class meetings ago, a couple weeks, I forget exactly, right? But uh, it was a notational convenience. It was a shorthand. I didn't like having to write down all those partial derivatives in the terms for the linear approximation. It was just notation. Up until now, the gradient has been a heavily algebraic concept. And now it's not. Now it's a geometric thing in a very natural way. The uh, gradient is the unique vector in the domain 
whose direction is the direction of fastest increase and whose magnitude is um, uh, telling me how, uh, how steep it is in that direction, or how, how what the rate of change is in that direction. So geometric, again, because this understands the gradient by way of its direction and magnitude. Those are geometric ideas. How are we doing? Does everybody see what my, my point here about? Well, it's awesome now that by previously, you know, mere notational convenience, we now see is geometrically extremely natural. All right, so here's an example of these ideas in action. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a little bit of terminology. Um, so uh, here, here's the question. We have a hill that's in the shape of a graph of a certain function, and we're going to – so here's my hill, right? And uh, let's see here. We're looking at the point here uh, sitting above this point down here. In the domain, now uh, there's an awkward little bit of language that I have to uh, entertain before we can uh, go on with the problem, and that is that uh, very often uh, we'll conflate these two points. I, I claim that this is something you've already done a million times, probably, right? I mean, let, let, how do you describe your location on the surface of the Earth? You give longitude and latitude. You never give altitude, right? <laughs> you know, you just assume sea level? No, <laughs> right? If I'm on Duke campus, I am not at sea level buried 300 feet underground. Of course I'm on the surface, right? So it's, uh, uh, you know, on the map, our location has longitude and latitude. In reality, we're actually sitting on the surface of the earth. Nobody wants to be so uh, uptight as to formally and strictly distinguish. This is perfectly obvious what we mean when we say a point on the map. Does that make sense? I hope that's natural. Um, so uh, th Now, I, I did, in this case here, I did say sitting above, right? So I specifically noted uh, the distinction between these points in the statement of the question just because this is our first time to encounter this issue. Uh, but uh, going forward, I probably won't, and nor will they in most other contexts that you'll see. So uh, it remains, though, that y'all have to distinguish, y'all have to keep in mind the differences between these two things, right? It's at this point where we physically are that we can talk about what uphill means, right? Uphill means as I literally climb up the graph, namely the hill, namely the surface of the earth, Right? That's what uphill means. Right? But when we ask what direction, we're always talking about map coordinates. Right? In this case, uh, the way I've got uh, the way I've got things set up with, uh, and by the way, it's pretty standard to think of uh, um, the y direction as being north. <laughs> right? With that in mind, this arrow that I have drawn here, that's southwest. So. If you're mountain climbing, again, nobody's going to say uphill is southwest and don't forget to walk up too. Yeah, over, yeah of course you're going to walk up. That's what uphill means. That's a given. right? So we just describe the direction. Uh, we don't bother with uh, the uh, 3D aspect of it. Okay, so heads up about this uh, blurring uh, and uh, the, the corresponding convenience, but the corresponding interpretations. Okay, okay so um, which way is uphill? Direction of steepest descent. Direction of fastest increase. Take a pick. Think about however you want to interpret it. But I just need to know what is the direction that the gradient points. And so here we go. We compute the gradient. We plug in the point in question. A couple of partial derivatives and arithmetic there, right? And that vector, right, that vector is pointing southwest. Um, how steep is it? Well, magnitude of the gradient. Again, simple arithmetic. 
it's pretty doggone steep in that direction. That's like nearly three, right? That's, that's, that's like this. That's, that's very, very steep in that direction. We're good. All right. Okay. Moving along, a um, couple of neat observations to make about uh, about how gradients can be uh, used for different things. Uh, so first, I'm going to make a, an observation that relates gradients to level sets. This is, I think, pretty unexpected, uh, but it uh, falls out pretty immediately. Uh, here is a level set. Uh, let's see here, uh, color choices. Uh, this surface right here, you'll note, described as a level set. some function f. This is where that function is equal to a constant. And uh, let's consider a hypothetical. Let's suppose that I'm at a given point on that level set and from that point, let's suppose that I'm moving uh, along the surface. So I'm moving tangent to the surface in any one of these directions like that, for example. Now let's suppose. Now here's an actual scenario uh, where that is the case. Uh, let me, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to zoom so I can draw better. Uh, there we go. So an actual scenario where I am momentarily at this point and moving with that velocity. Uh, here could be my actual path. Let me draw the actual path. Maybe I start uh, over here and then I walk about like that to over here. At the instant that I am at that point A, I am indeed moving with that velocity right there. Right. So this idea that a tangent vector to a surface can be a velocity, yeah, of course, right? I mean, that's, in fact, depending on which textbooks you look at, this is the definition of a tangent vector. It's the velocity of a path in your surface. It's pretty reasonable, I think. So okay, well let's uh, let's think about uh, just uh, uh, you know momentarily a, a question as I walk along this path. In other words, when I'm at that point, moving with this velocity as I am as I walk along this path, how fast is f changing? And there's an immediate answer to this question. As I walk along this path here. <laughs> Uh, I remain entirely in that surface where f is constant. If f is constant, then f is not changing, which means that its rate of change is zero. Is that cool, right? I mean, pretty believable, I hope. And uh, here's the thing. Uh, df ds is directional derivative. Uh, directional derivative is dot product with the gradient. And so if I know, uh, <clears throat> as I've argued here, if I know that df ds is zero, that tells me the dot product with the gradient is zero. And that tells me this fact right here, that the gradient is perpendicular to that tangent vector. Everybody follow that little part of the argument there? This is only for level sets, though. Correct. This is very, very importantly just if the surface is a level set of F. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, well, all right. Now let's summarize. Remind ourselves of uh, what we've got here. And this is a big mess. Let's clean up our mess. Um, <clears throat> what we have is that the gradient vector, this thing called the gradient vector, uh, well, it's, uh, it's got to be perpendicular to my tangent vector to the surface. Wait a minute. It's got to be perpendicular to every tangent vector to the surface. Now, wait a second. <laughs> my, this, uh, this gradient's got to be perpendicular to every tangent vector. That means it's perpendicular to the tangent plane. That means, I think, a reasonable conclusion. It's perpendicular to the surface itself. And so this is the powerful conclusion. Uh, your gradient vector will always be perpendicular uh, to 
the surface, namely the level set, because it's perpendicular to all of the tangent vectors to that level set. So really nice conclusion. Gradients are always perpendicular to level sets. You know what I should have said? Orthogonal gradient vector could be zero, of course, right? Anyway, okay. Everybody buy it? This is, by the way, this is one of the big facts about the calculus of level sets. Remember, we were talking before um, at great length mm, excuse me, um, about how uh, calculus geometrically looks different depending on what kind of a picture you're drawing. Right? What does a partial derivative look like? I, it depends. Are you looking at a picture, a graph picture? Are you looking at a level set picture? Are you looking at uh, a parametric curve? What are we doing? Right? So this is a huge part of the calculus of level sets because a gradient is a calculus object. It says I'm taking derivatives and assembling them in a certain particular way. That's calculus. And here is a very geometrically meaningful statement about how that relates to level sets and what that calculus looks like in the level set context. It's perpendicular to the surface. So very, arguably one of the most important things to say about the calculus of level sets right here. Okay. Cool. All right. Here's a quick application of that. I'm going to let you all read most of the details here. Uh, but uh, I'll just remind you uh, of uh, uh, the, the setup, and then I'm going to hit the highlights and, again, leave the details for you all. Um, we've previously understood the tangent plane. right? We've talked about tangent planes. Uh, it's the graph of the linear approximation. The linear approximation we understood in terms of partial derivatives. That was just, that's what we had to work with at the time. That's, uh, you know, all we, that was our only option in some sense. Um, okay, fine. But here's a different point of view. Um, setting things up. So suppose you're looking at a graph. Right? So Z is f of x comma y. That's what it means to be a graph. And uh, here's my tangent plane to that graph. Again, I have a formula that comes from linear approximations and partial derivatives. Right. Um, check it out. We have an old observation that a graph can always be reinterpreted as a level set of a different function, right? And there's this uh, little quick little move, right? This little uh, 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 tricky little uh, fast one that you can pull where you take the right side and you subtract it over the left side. And now, lo and behold, I have stuff equals constant, right? Stuff equals zero. Hardly anything happened. But it remains that now I've got this different function called g there, right? And I am pretty clearly looking at a level set of this other function g. So while in the past we understood this tangent plane from the point of view of how it was a graph and the function it was a graph of and partial derivatives of that function because it's a graph and it's all that business, we're now going to take a different point of view, which is forget about that graph business. right? I am now looking at a level set Same surface. It's just that now I'm going to think of it as being a level set. Here's the function that it's a level set of. And uh, how would we find a tangent plane to a level set? And that's actually pretty straightforward uh, because uh, we, just, we just proved a theorem that says that whatever function, let's see here, let me, uh, let me do it like this. Whatever function you're looking at a level set of, the gradient is always perpendicular to that level set. And so that gradient, I can call my normal vector. Right, so I'm going to understand this tangent plane not by understanding uh, what the cross sections are parallel to. I'm going to understand this normal vector, th this, uh, this tangent plane, excuse me, by understanding this immediately, writing down its normal vector. Over there. 
So uh, now the rest is uh, really just a bunch of algebra. Uh, if you think it through, uh, here I have a function of x, y, and z, and I can totally take its gradient. That's just a couple of partial derivatives. And once you have that gradient understood as the normal vector, then you can plug that straight into this old equation going way back to, you know, uh, arguably Math 218, the equation of a plane, right? And um, just write it down and uh, do a little algebra, and here's what comes out as your equation of your tangent plane. And conveniently, this is exactly the formula that we got previously. So it's, it's a, just a different point of view on a formula that we already had. But it's always nice to have different points of view on things. Arguably, I think this is an easier calculation. We don't have to argue, uh, you know, what is a linear approximation. And, uh, you know, there was actually a bunch of work that went into this idea of a linear approximation. I feel like this kind of gets right down to it. All right. All right. So um, th there's really nothing that interesting in this example. Uh, I'm going to just hit the highlights and make a quick observation. Uh, this is literally just uh, walking through the details of exactly what's on the previous page. Uh, we are asked to find the tangent plane to a graph. Uh, we do so by realizing that that graph is a level set because these two equations are equivalent. I don't have to think of it as a graph. I can just say phooey on this. Uh, I, I don't want to look at a graph of F. I want to look at a level set of G. And once I know that I'm looking at a level set of G, uh, there we go. Once I know I'm looking at a level set of G, okay, you take the gradient, you plug in the given point, that gives you your normal vector. There's the equation of a plane. Everything else is details. Just like on the previous page. Okay. All right. Now, the, the uh, additional observation I want to point out here, and this is kind of nice, um, I've presented this as a way to find the equation of a tangent plane to a graph. Um, but our first step was to turn the graph into a level set. So let me just observe, if you were to just kind of remove all of this stuff up here, and if the problem were to come to you initially with no discussion about graphs, if the question were to come to you immediately as just a question about, uh, well, here's an equation, or, uh, you know, uh, this is a level set of that function, no mention of graph at all, then it's even easier. <laughs> it's already a level set. Gradient gives you normal vector which gives you the equation of the plane. So this is not exclusive to graphs. This works for, this basically same idea works even if it's not a graph. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. Okay, so now on to a, uh, a new topic. Uh, this is a subtle one. Um, this is something y'all might have seen before, but I'll bet you it was treated uh, pretty quick and dirty. Um, gets glossed over, certainly in most high school uh, single variable calculus classes. And case could be made, and I, gr I it recognize that, well, yeah, but they don't know multivariable calculus, so they kind of can't really treat this better than they do. Well, anyway, the case can be made on both sides. But there, it's, it's understandable why they kind of sweep this under the rug. But now that we are in a multivariable calculus context, we've really got to address this reasonably. Uh, and so here we go. Here's the question. Uh, suppose you are looking at a, an equation of a curve. So here's an equation. Of course, you can always describe an equation as something equals zero, because whatever's on one side, you can just subtract to the other side. So suppose I have an equation like that. Um, <clears throat> and suppose I'm looking at a point 
uh, let's say uh, let's say this point right here. And I want to understand what is happening near that point. And so I'm going to say locally. And locally just means, yeah, uh, be very myopic about this. Don't pay attention to anything that's not happening other than right next to where that point is. And away from that point, I really don't care. So we're going to throw away and ignore all of this. And wherever it goes after that, we just ignore. Locally just means tunnel vision just nearby. How nearby? As nearby as you want it to be. Right? As nearby as might be useful. Okay. All right. So locally, can I view y as being a function of x? Uh, <clears throat> let me say that a little bit differently. Um, this is an equation, yeah, 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 sure. This also could be viewed as, hey, suppose I'm looking at a level set. And the question, can uh, y be viewed locally as a function of x, then kind of asks, well, can I view just a little piece of that level set as being a graph? So you can think of this algebraically as, <coughs> can I view the input variable y as being an output variable? You can view this geometrically as, can I view a level set as being a graph? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you remember we kind of talked about a version of this uh, at, at one point. I, I made the observation that every graph is a level set. That, that's cool, right? Every graph is a level set. But I pointed out not every level set is a graph. I gave an example where it absolutely is not, right? Here we're asking this refined question, Given a level set, can I view it as a graph? But with the refinement, again, being that I'm only interested locally. So it's a tougher question at this point. Okay, so some quick answers. Uh, what about uh, at uh, this point? Can I locally view this as being a graph? Well, yes, I can because that little piece of curve right there, it uh, passes the vertical line test, no problem. So yay, that yes uh, can be viewed locally as a function or locally that is a graph, however you want to say it. Okay, what about, now this is a tricky one, what about this point right here? A lot of people would say it fails the vertical line test because it hits three times. But remember, we're only interested locally. And locally, oh, ah, ah I wanted to be in the highlighter mode here. Uh, locally, I'm only looking at that little, uh, that little small vicinity. I don't care about anything that's going on over there or over here. Don't care. Not relevant to the question. And locally, this curve is only... Oh, uh, man, I keep hitting the wrong buttons. Uh, locally, this curve is only this little bit of curve right there. And that little bit of curve passes the vertical line test. No problem. So the answer at that point, also yes. Um, <clears throat> but what about this point? And I claim we have a problem. The problem is not that this vertical line hits twice. That's not the problem. Again, we're looking locally. We actually don't care about uh, uh, whoopsie uh, about uh, anything that's going on over here. We just couldn't care less, right? The problem is that at this point. Uh, if I can get this to expand, there we go. At that point, even if I restrict my attention locally, just a small little neighborhood there, the curve does like this. And no matter how small of a neighborhood I'm looking at, no matter how myopic I choose to be on this, right, there's no getting around the fact that that curve, even locally, will fail the vertical line test. So there's no way around it. At this point, near this point, even locally, no, this is, this is not a graph. Y just cannot be viewed as a function of X near that point. Does that make sense to everybody? 
Yeah. yeah. So it would. So it's on the ex- extrema that it would. It's uh, if, if you were considering. Yeah, I know what you mean. Right. Yeah. Would be like if, if if it was like. Yeah. It, some Anywhere else, yeah. I, however, however little it might have been moved over. I mean, let's suppose that I were looking at, you know, just ever so slightly further down here, right? Then I could be extremely myopic and only look just in that teeny tiny little, and then uh, and then there's no problem, and so everything's fine. Yeah. So it's only at that one point, and I'm going to avoid for the moment characterizing exactly what it is about that point, right? But uh, but uh, yes. Everybody happy? Okay. All right. Now, I want to address a very natural question related to this, which is who cares? Right? Seems like we're getting into awfully fussy area. Right? But here's the thing, uh, and you all have seen this in single variable calculus classes. Sometimes you have an equation, and you want to be able to do calculus, and you want to be able to look at the curve, and you want to be able to talk about the slope, and you want to be able to talk about dy, dx. Right? You all have absolutely done this <laughs> before. Right? Well, uh, can you really talk about a derivative of something if you don't yet know if that thing's even a function. Right? I mean, look back at the original algebra. In this original algebra here, x and y are both independent variables. There is a point of view that says, look, as things are given, y is not in any way a function of x. In fact, um, I mean, when I take the derivative with respect to x, aren't I supposed to hold y constant? And uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? When you say dy dx, right? You can't make any sense out of dy dx until you know at least locally that that y is actually a function. We take derivatives of functions, right? So if you want the algebra that you write down to not be meaningless garbage, and I think that's important, right? (laughs) If you want it to not be meaningless garbage, um, trustable, Right? If you want it to be definitely established, meaningful, non-garbage, <laughs> right? uh, then we have to answer this question. We're going to have to figure out how to make sure that the point I'm looking at is like one of these and not one of these. How do I tell these apart without uh, you know, relying on uh, uh, Fortunate, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, geometric intuition. We just happen to get lucky sometimes, and like I understand circles, and I can just look and see, right? But if this is some wacky curve like this, ah, uh, how do you know? Okay. So uh, here's a way to address this. I think this is really nice. Uh, so uh, yeah, here's what a level set looks like, and uh, uh, let's talk about the key point. You know, what, is, uh, what characterizes this point here as being a problem? And what it means that this is a problem is uh, <clears throat> various different ways you can say it. I'm going to say this in a way that I think is more geometrically satisfying. I don't want to be rigorous about this. Uh, that's not what this class is, right? But from a, come on, you know what I mean point of view, the problem at that point is that that at that exact moment, that is exactly where the curve is wrapping under itself, or depending on if you're going the other way, it's wrapping over itself. Does that make sense? That's what causes this piece of curve to fail the vertical line test. Um, so now here's uh, okay another case to be made for what that means is that means I have a vertical tangent line. And a lot of students are tempted to say, oh, that means dy dx has to be undefined. You can't say that yet. We don't know why it's a function. You can't even talk about dy dx yet because we don't know if y is or isn't a function. Right? So let me just you know, restrict that temptation. Forget that temptation to talk about dy dx being undefined or something like that. We, we have no access to that. We can just say vertical tangent line. Okay. Now, recently established fact gradients are always perpendicular to curves, 
namely, well, uh, specifically level sets, right? <laughs> so notice here, I'm looking at the gradient of the exact same function whose level set I'm looking at. And gradients are perpendicular to the level sets, and if you have a vertical tangent line, then you're going to have a horizontal gradient. And then let me remind you that the, um, the gradient, of course, is, uh, uh, oh gosh, ah, come on. Partial of f with respect to x, uh, partial of f with respect to y, and if that's horizontal, let's see here, colors, horizontal means that the vertical component is zero. That makes sense? So altogether then, if you have a problem that will manifest itself by the y partial of f being zero. And as stated here, this isn't all that useful. Uh, <laughs> I need something that answers the question about whether I have a problem. I don't need, I don't need a statement that presumes awareness of whether or not I have a problem. Right? So we uh, pull the usual move. This is uh, the contrapositive. Remember, the contrapositive of a statement like that is this statement right here. And, uh, of course, this is very useful because it gives us an algebraic condition. I just take the f, take the partial with respect to y, and if it's not 0, then I don't have a problem and all is good. And this is a good place to end it for today. We'll uh, pick up here on Friday. See you all later. Have a good one.